welcome to Christ Alone Evangelical Lutheran Church of Thienesville in Mequon, Wisconsin, as we gather on this the second Sunday in the season of Lent to consider the wonderful gift that God has given us as citizens of heaven. May the Lord bless our worship together. And our worship begins with the opening hymn, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I'm altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. 
In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We join in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading. For this, the second Sunday in the season of Lent, is recorded for us in the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah, chapter 26. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, You must die! Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate to the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he's prophesied against this city. You've heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against the house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death... You will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Our second reading, which will also serve as the sermon text for this day, is recorded for us in the third chapter of the book of Philippians, going into verse 1 of chapter 4. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. Dear friends, this too, the word of our God. We share the gospel acclamation. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross.
Our gospel is recorded in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. We join now in our hymn of the day, What Grace Is This? Grace to you in peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As was mentioned earlier, we'll be following Philippians chapter 3 and 4 for our sermon. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. My dear friends, 
Earlier this week, the number of Ukrainian refugees fleeing to neighboring countries like Poland was over 1.5 million. Ukraine is still their country. They are citizens of Ukraine and only visitors technically of the neighboring countries. I'm certain they have every hope to return to their country soon, even though large portions of it have no doubt been devastated by the war with Russia. Pause for a moment and consider the situation. Citizens of a country, they hope to be soon be theirs again, but living away from that country for a time. In many ways, that's a vivid illustration of the life of a Christian, isn't it? We're visiting here on earth while our citizenship is in heaven. We look with hope to the time when our war with evil and sin is over and we will enjoy the blessings of home with our Savior. We want to take some time today to consider just that thought. Our citizenship is in heaven. How shall we survive until we get there? What it'll be like when we arrive. To survive where we are, we have to understand the environment we're living in. That's what Paul was doing for the Philippians. He had them, or had been telling them, what they were up against. He had told them that they would encounter many who were enemies of the cross. I can't say for sure who these enemies were. They may have been those which were teaching that the only way to save yourself was through the keeping of the law, sometimes known as the Judaizers. Jesus and his sacrifice were not enough, in their opinion. And you had to do the work. You had to do the work to get to heaven. They may have been a variation of humanists who taught that life was not about some God, but all about you and doing things your way. A society of narcissism, you might say. Live for yourself, eat, drink, and be merry. That's how life is to be lived and appreciated. This was their God. They had Rome to take care of them. Rome would protect them, feed them, and provide for them. But how does Paul teach him to survive? He tells them that they should follow his example, and the example of his co-workers like Timothy and Epaphroditus. Follow their ways of staying faithful to the Lord and following all that he has done. Now you might think that may sound a little bit, shall we say, bragging on the part of Paul, but it truly wasn't for that was his lifestyle. But he also wrote to the Corinthians that he himself, it wasn't his model. It was a model that he followed, a model of Christ. It was Christ's love that compelled him to do his work and to live and serve his Lord. Just as you have us as a model, he said, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. The reason for doing this should have been obvious as well. The goal and the result of what the enemies of the cross were offering was destruction, while the goal of the cross is life eternal. So how are we to survive? Sometimes it's as simple as recognizing the time we live in and understanding that it's not so different from when the Apostle Paul lived. Kind of to prove that point just a bit, I, I'd like to quote for you from the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. In his book, he lists what he considered to be five main reasons that Rome fell as a nation and a people. Number one, the rapid increase of divorce. The undermining of dignity and the sanctity of the home, which is the basis of human society. Number two, higher and higher taxes and the spending of public money for free bread and circuses for the populace. Number three, the mad craze for pleasure. Sports becoming every year more exciting and more brutal. Four, the building of gigantic armaments when the real enemy was within the decadence of the people. And five, the decay of religion. Faith fading into mere form, losing touch with life, and becoming impotent to guide the people. Does any of that sound familiar? Oh, and by the way, the book was completed in 1787, before there could be any comparison for what we're dealing with today. Absolutely, 
Paul was inspired to write not only for the Philippians and for the time under Rome, but for us today. Who are your role models? Do we follow Paul and what he taught? Do we follow Jesus as the only Savior? Well, if anyone should, we should. And if, like the Philippians, we need to hear this again, consider yourself told again. Put away all that society likes to use to erode your confidence in Jesus Christ. Put away any thoughts that life is just about me. Our citizenship is in heaven. Know that. Believe that. Live that. Just because we aren't there yet doesn't mean it's not ours. As a matter of fact, Paul made it very clear that it is already ours, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Knowing that our citizenship is in heaven, we survive the here and now through faith in our Lord Jesus, through the cross of Jesus. And we are motivated to do that because we know what is ahead. For those that were enemies of the cross, we learn that there's nothing but destruction waiting for them. And all their hope is in the things of this earth, all the things that are passing, but not us. No, we eagerly await a Savior from heaven who will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious body. Sin will be gone. Pain, no longer. Sickness, finished. Sadness, removed. Hunger, eliminated. Depression, vanished. Joy, unending. All because of a Savior who loves you and me that he became the perfect sacrifice for us all. The Romans, a great percentage of the population of Philippi at this time, believed in a Savior too. They believed that Caesar was their Savior. Already in 48 BC, in the town of Ephesus, Caesar was proclaimed to be the Savior of all. A Savior who did nothing but take from his people, not sacrifice for them. Who could offer only games and free bread, but not life and the bread of life. Jesus, who has all power, will transform us and is transforming us even today. Once we were dead in sin, now we're alive in Christ. Once we were ruled by sin, now we're set free. Once we lived only for ourselves, now we live for others and for Jesus. We live not as citizens of this earth. We are but visitors here, refugees, you might say. Our citizenship is in heaven. Consider yourself but a refuge here, and heaven is your home. And with that confidence, that sure hope, that promise of glory, we also hear again the apostle tell us, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. I can't add anything to that, except to tell you to make it happen. Because Christ already has. Amen. And now may the peace and the joy that comes to us as citizens of heaven ever keep your hearts and minds in true faith till we stand with him in glory everlasting. Amen. And what a joy it is that we can share such a common faith together and we do so now as we hear and use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in the prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, because of our sins, we justly deserve to suffer both your curse during our time on earth 
and your condemnation eternally in hell. But we plead for your mercy because your son Jesus suffered the punishment of our sins deserved. For his sake, you have forgiven our sins and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Now, trusting that he will intercede for us, we dare to ask for your blessing. Mercifully provide whatever each of us may need for body and life. Protect us and those we love from all harm and danger. Maintain good government among us and bless all those in authority with wisdom and integrity. Defend us from the devil and the world which would lure us back into the way that leads to eternal death. Destroy in us the desires that are contrary to your will. Comfort the persecuted, the depressed, the sick, the dying, with the assurance that nothing can separate us from your love. Strengthen our faith by the word of your forgiveness and by the sacrament of our Savior's own body and blood. Grant that we may praise you, our merciful God, by showing mercy to others in all their needs. We commit to your care our bodies and souls and all things, because you've purchased us to be your own with the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we also pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our worship service this day with the singing of Jerusalem the Golden. We are delighted that you are able to join us in worship this day. 
And we certainly hope you can join us again next week as we continue to contemplate the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we are glad to know you, we encourage you to write us an email if you'd like. Send us your comments or questions. Or if you'd like more information about our church, you can certainly look at the website address that is listed for you at the end of the video. We thank you for your support and prayers. May the Lord richly bless you in the week ahead.